Stevie, I saw your slides. Do you okay, want to go a little bit to see what to test it out? Okay, I, and the slides are properly sharing right now? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, perfect. Okay, without further ado, um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Stephen Boyd. Stephen is the Samsung Professor of Engineering and Professor and Chair of Electrical Engineering at Stanford University. Also with courtesy appointments in computer science and management of science and engineering. Stephen has done a lot of fundamental work in combat simulation. He's also authored many seminal work in this domain and also several books, including the popular and beloved combat simulation book, as, which I think everyone reads. Um, his group has also developed several open source tools like CVX and CVXPy that are widely used in academia and the industry. His current research focus is on combat optimization applications in control, signal processing, machine learning, finance, and uh, circuit design. Today, he's going to talk about embedded combat optimization for control. Steven, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Um, um, let's see, I also wanted to say that unfortunately I was teaching just until a few minutes ago, and so I didn't get to join until now. Um, so I won't be able to relate what I'm talking about to some of the previous talks, which I know in fact were uh, quite, quite relevant. Um, so I'm going to talk about embedded uh, convex optimization for control. And um, this is, I mean, the slides were assembled by me and some of my uh, students in the case of Shane, uh, uh, former students. Um, so uh, let me say a little bit about the talk. Um, so the, the first is uh, that I, I, the math is going to be sloppy and I'm going to talk a lot about just ideas. Uh, and they're not even complicated ideas. Um, occasionally, I'll, I'll issue opinions. Um, some of them will actually be a little bit controversial, I hope. Um, and also, I'm not going to spend my time uh, saying who did what when. So I'm just going to talk about a lot of stuff that was done by other people, and I won't say anything about it. So, um, and finally, you know, I won't have any fun videos or, or cool examples. Uh, 
So not because they don't exist, but because I just wanted to talk about the ideas in this talk. Um, so first I'll talk about convex optimization control uh, policies. Um, so the basic idea, it, it's not, not deep or anything, it's, it's just this, that a lot of control policies are based on solving a convex optimization problem. Um, and so we're gonna call these, well, COCPs or convex optimization control policies. So some examples would be things like LQR, uh, linear quadratic regulator. I'll say something about that in a minute. Um, generic convex control, uh, things like approximate dynamic programming in the right context. Um, MPC or receding, uh, or receding horizon goal, R RHC. Um, things like it's often used in single and multi uh, period uh, trading uh, in finance. Um, I'll talk about a couple of other uh, very useful problems, things like actuator allocation and resource, uh, real time resource allocation. Now, a couple of these are analytically solvable, like the linear quadratic regulator, uh, but our focus is actually on the others where you actually solve to evaluate a control policy, a real convex optimization problem without an analytical solution. Um, so we'll start, well, we'll start with a case where you can. That's traditional quadratic control. So here you have your, uh, your linear dynamics here. Uh, X is your state, U is your input, and WT is some uh, disturbance uh, that zero mean. Um, we have a convex quadratic stage cost. This is all traditional. This is from 1960. Um, and what we should do is find a policy, UT, which is a function of XT, and it should uh, minimize the average stage cost. Now, the optimal uh, policy, that's a linear quadratic regulator, has the following form, that what you should do is you should minimize the immediate cost. Um, X is already fixed, XT, that's a fixed cost, so I don't have to put it here. Plus, basically, this is something like the cost to go from where you land, and I should optimize over my uh, what what I can do uh, over over the sum of those two. Now, this this thing that you're minimizing here is a convex quadratic function, and so it has an analytical solution. And so most people think of just simply writing it this way: u t equals k x t, because the solution of a of if you have a quadratic function and you minimize over one variable, in this case u t, um, the the result is a linear function of the remaining uh, variable x t. And so you think of it this way: you get a linear policy. But I claim this as a COCP, convex optimization control policy. Um, now, we can also just do uh, very general convex control. So here, uh, suppose my dynamics are linear uh, or affine in the state and in the state and the control, that's XT and UT. Omega T is uh, some disturbance, uh, those are IID. Um, and uh, suppose the stage cost is convex in X and U, doesn't have to be quadratic, just convex. And your goal is to minimize the expected average stage cost. Well, the optimal policy is once again, it comes from dynamic programming or you know, Bellman's formulation. It's this, you should minimize the immediate cost plus the cost to go, that's the uh, Bellman or value or cost to go function V of F of X, T, U and omega T, and you should take in, in expectation. So you wanna minimize the average of that over U. Um, and here again, this, this function, the expected value of the immediate stage cost in the second term, which takes into account the future, that's a convex function, right? Because, you know, convexity is going to play nicely with, ex, uh, with uh, expectation and sum and stuff like that. So here is an example of a convex optimization control policy, just generic optimal control in convex uh, control. Now, maybe more useful, uh, is approximate dynamic programming. So here, uh, what you do is you simply substitute here for the true value function, you substitute some kind of an approximation. And this approximation, you're gonna choose it uh, to, uh, with, with two ideas in mind. Uh, number one, it should capture the general shape of the actual true value function. Um, and the second part is it should make this optimization problem where I, I, I solve, I minimize over U, this expression, um, I should make that thing, uh, that thing should be tractable. So I can do that in real time, right? So that's the idea. And this requires only that F is affine in U, not X, and G is convex in, in, in U only. They do not have to be, uh, they don't have any curvature with respect to XT or anything like that or with respect to X. Okay. So this is approximate dynamic programming. And I guess I, I, I don't mind mentioning, uh, since everyone 
here is 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 in control. Uh, you know that I, I feel like one of the dirty secrets of control is the following: is that uh, you know th this is going to give you a really good policy if v hat is a good approximation of v. That's sort of obvious. Um, but here's one of the dirty secrets. It turns out you get an awesome, a really good control, uh, even when v hat is a rather poor approximation of v. V hat only really has to capture kind of the gross shape of V. Now, people know this, everyone knows this, but people don't state it that often. Uh, but once again, this is obviously a COCP, a convex optimization control policy. Um, next up uh, is another extremely practical method, model predictive control. So here, uh, the dynamics function is affine in X, U, stage cost is convex in X and U. And what we do is we do something kind of ridiculous. We make a single prediction or forecast of what these uncertain variables are. Um, if those were zero mean things, the most common forecast is just zero. So what you do is you minimize, you simply, you pretend that there's no uncertainty over some horizon H periods long. You pretend that there's none. You pretend that your forecast is what's really gonna go down and you make a plan based on uh, based on your forecast. Um, and you do that by solving this problem here, which is a convex optimization problem. So you plan a full trajectory over the states and the controls over this horizon. And then you only use the current uh, state, you just use the current control. And that's, that's the policy. So that's another convex optimization control policy because you evaluate the policy by minimizing a convex function or solving a convex problem. Now, there, there's been a lot of work on, on variations on that, on making this robust. I'll mention one that as a practical matter, as a theoretical matter is extremely unsophisticated and as a practical matter actually does really well. Um, and it's just, you know, multi-forecast uh, model predictive control, which I guess we call, or we're trying to propagate the, I, the, the, the it should be called MFMPC. And yes, that is a joke. Um, so, um, all right, so you have multiple forecasts. So we're going to denote these as omega i hat uh, tau given t. That's the prediction of what, what will omega be uh, under forecast i at time tau, and it's the forecast made at time t. And these are, we think of these as scenarios or contingencies, right? These are just, and, and the only real requirement is that these should be plausible. When you see these scenarios, when you see these forecasts, someone, it should not be that someone would say that could never happen. They should simply say that's reasonable. Um, and you, you can make this uh, statistical. Actually, I think that's a little bit silly, frankly. That's uh, over mathematizing things, but nevertheless, that's it. So now what you do is this. You make a plan for every single scenario and you add a single constraint that the first action is the same. So this is actually equivalent to doing, uh, to, to basically relaxing the original information pattern and making it very elementary. It's basically, number one, there are only K things that can happen. That's the first part. And the second part is, after you commit to your first action, then I will tell you which of the K occurs. So that's the information pattern for which this would be optimal. I mean, it's silly, but the point is uh, that that's an interpretation for it. Okay. I'll mention a couple of uh, more practical ones, not generic ones. Um, single period trading. So in that, your job is to choose a, an asset allocation weight. These add up to one. They don't have to be uh, positive, though. Uh, they, can, they can be negative, which corresponds to short positions. So the idea is that we are going to uh, choose WT. Um, and or uh, I, I should say we're going to we're going to we're going to choose trades. Uh, we'll let WT WT is our current one. I'm sorry. W till DT is going to be the post trade allocation. Um, that means so the trades will be something like W till DT minus WT, and we're going to maximize uh, something a composite objective that has got a couple of term of terms in it. The first one is the expected return. So alpha T is a forecast or expected return, right? Actually, forecast is a more accurate. Uh, is, is a more accurate uh, a way to say it than, than expectation, right? And expectation requires you to believe that these are actually random and that there's a mean and all that kind of stuff, all of which is false. Um, the second term is a risk aversion term. So here, sigma t is a, is a, forecast, a forecasted return covariance. Um, and this second term is going to be the forecasted variance of the total portfolio value, right? That's this term. And there's a parameter gamma called the risk aversion 
parameter. And the more you turn that up, uh, the more you will choose a W tilde for which this is small. The last two terms are a so-called holding a cost and a transaction cost. And they are really essentially uh, penalties or uh, objective terms that depend on roughly the, the portfolio and change in portfolio. Transaction cost is change in portfolio. <clears throat> and uh, the holding would include things like a shorting cost or something like that, if there's a cost to holding something. Anyway, so that's what that is. And uh, when you take this and do the multi-period version, you get something called you know, multi-period uh, trading. And that's an example of a specific convex optimization control uh, policy. Okay. I'll mention a couple of, I wanna mention a couple of others which are super duper simple, but actually also like super useful. So the first one is um, actual actuator allocation. So the idea is that a high level control policy produces the desired and forces and torques. Let's call that FT. So I guess you call that a wrench or something. Um, and so you would get the forces and torques that you would like to apply, let's say for the next 15 milliseconds. And then the question is how to apply it. Uh, how, to, how to achieve those forces and torques, right? And so actuator allocation says you should solve a little problem that looks like this. You should minimize uh, GT of U. Um, that's some convex uh, cost function. It could have fuel use, energy, whatever you like in it, this kind of thing. Um, plus lambda times U minus UT minus one. UT minus one is, what you, is the actual actuator value from the previous uh, time. Right, and so, and what this is a this is simply a smoothing term, and it, it's subject to the fact that the the actuator uh, vector you're choosing is allowable. Number one, and then this is at is what maps your actuators into your forces and torques that you put on on the uh, on on whatever the the system is. Right, um, and so that's the that that's the basic idea. Um, and this this actually, I mean, this is kind of obvious. It's very simple. There's no theory of any kind whatsoever here. Um, but actually just having something like this gracefully handles all sorts of stuff. Uh, actuator failure, degradation, varying effectiveness, right? So um, for example, I mean, even just the simplest things, a lot of actuators are, you know, tied to a body frame or something like that. And so the absolute force and torque is going to depend on the orientation of the uh, vehicle, right? So that's one that's going to be embedded in AT. Um, if you have things like actuator failure, degradation, that's real simple. You just change the, the, the UT set. You just simply say, oh, hey, guess what? Your, you know, thruster number seven. It's not working. So, and that means that in the U7 is going to be zero or something like that. And this thing will do perfectly well uh, there. Okay. So, and actually, that's actually a perfectly that that's a that's that's a really good use just to have something like this. Uh, so that's actuator allocation. Very simple, super useful. And it is again, it is a method that it it maps a a required uh, force and torque. Uh, it it given that it figures out how to actually achieve it with the actuators that you have right now. Okay. One last one I'll mention is a, a is a real time resource allocator. So the way that works is you have m resources which are to be distributed across n agents or tasks. Right. So for example, at a data center, you have resources like uh, you know power, number of cores. Um, you know, the total number, the amount of IO bandwidth you're going to allocate to each of your agents or, or tasks, uh, things like that. Um, the amount of memory you're going to allocate to each of them, this sort of stuff. Um, you have available resources, which can be changing with time and also unexpectedly. Um, and the, the action is a resource allocation. That's a matrix. And what it does is it tells you how much of each resource you allocate to each agent or task. So that, that's the idea there. Um, okay, and we're gonna solve it by maximizing some kind of utility, which is a concave function. Um, and usually it's separable across tasks, but it doesn't, certainly doesn't have to be. Um, and then subject to the fact that these allocations are non-negative. And this says that they add up, if you look at the total resources you are using, that's U1, that vector, is less than 80. That's a vector of what is available at time t. And that could be varying as well. And again, outside your, uh, out, out, outside, um, your control, right? That it's simply announced every second what the total amount of resources you have, and you have to allocate it. Right. So again, simple. This is static. I, you couldn't call this a control problem because there are no dynamics, but nevertheless, it's an important part, I believe, of, of, of control.
Okay, so at this point, what I'll do is, is talk about the general form. So the general form of a COCP is that the action UT is a solution of a convex optimization problem. And we're gonna write that this way. You minimize F0 of X, T, U, and theta, subject to Fi of X, T, U, theta less than or equal to zero, and then a set of linear inequality constraints, right? And here I'm, I'm writing X, T as the state, or a better term for it actually is the context rather than the state. Uh, state suggests something more than just the context. Roughly speaking, X, T is just everything you know at time T, and will inform your action, right? Um, one thing important here I've slipped in are these parameters, uh, the thetas, right? So the theta here, these are parameters and they flavorize the policy. So uh, I'll, I'll talk uh, quite a bit about, about these, uh, th these parameters, right? So this is, this is the idea. That is a COCP. And what we're gonna do now is talk about like, why? Like, wh why would you use a COCP, right? Um, and actually what it really comes down to is actually kind of interesting and, and it's, a, it's a very basic distinction. It's really the difference between procedural versus declarative. So procedural is where, you know, a procedural policy is one where you actually work out exactly what to do in a given context, right? So for example, if it's a hybrid vehicle control, you know, it might be a big table that says, you know, if your battery is less than 22% charged, and this and that, then do this. And if that, something like that, or a very famous example would be PI. So here's, here is a PI uh, control. And it's basically just writing out what it does uh, depending on the context. Um, now, in contrast, a declarative policy is kind of interesting. Um, in, a, in, a, in a declarative policy, the way you do that is a designer articulates what she wants and requires. Those are literally the objective and constraints and then lets the optimization solver figure out how to do it. So, um, and I know, you know, we're, we're all used to this. I think everyone, you know, at, at this meeting would, 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 would get that. Um, I have had some hilarious uh, conversations with old school people. Uh, and I remember one went like this. One, <laughs> one, one said to me, uh, you could probably guess who this is anyway. <laughs> so one, one said to me like, look, I know what to do if, if, if an airplane is like rolling to the left, you know, it's like tip up your right aileron or <laughs> something like that. I was like, cool. And I said, yeah, well, here's how I do it. I tell an optimization problem. I don't like, I like flying level. And then I give it a model of the dynamics and it fig and, and then the person said to me, well, what does it do? I said, it raises the right aileron. He said, yeah, but I knew that anyway. So, um, so, so the point is that, but it's, it, it's an interesting, it's, it's a complete, it's just a way to think about it. Uh, it's not deep, but this is often the confusion when someone says, I, I, what, the, what is the difference? Right. So, um, Okay, so let me start with the advantages of a, of a COCP. Well, the first one is they are interpretable. We know exactly what they do, right? Um, they, res they respect constraints better than some posterior projection clipping, fixing things up, right? If, if you do LQR and then you clip your actuators to the allowed ranges, you know, you'll get a policy, a control policy. It's actually probably not that bad. Um, but something like this would do better. Um, what's cool is you can also throw in tons. You can safety fence your policy. And what that means is you throw in a whole bunch of constraints, which are in normal operations, simply not active. Uh, but they're sitting there very quietly and, and will not allow you to do something insane. Um, the other one, as I already mentioned in the context of uh, actuator allocation, is this very gracefully handles changing dynamics, availabilities, and failures, right? Because you know, what happens is when the, if the dynamics change, if there's some availability or a failure of an actuator or a sensor or something like that, then all you do is you change the optimization problem you're solving and, and, you, uh, and, and you proceed, right? Um, and they can be very effectively tuned. I'm gonna say a lot about that uh, in a bit. Um, no, so here's one thing you do here uh, from, and maybe from some people, uh, is, is they'd say like, there's no, I'm not gonna solve a convex optimization problem at 100 every 10 milliseconds. You gotta be kidding. Uh, like that's, that's not, it's gotta be, it's gotta have 100.0% reliability and it's gotta be, I have to meet my real time deadline all the time and so on. And it turns out that, that is a non disadvantage because that, I mean, depending on the problem, of course, 
that's readily achieved. Can make them totally reliable. They can you can make the reliability one one point zero. Um, actually, in some cases, you can even achieve division free, uh, which is pretty awesome because that means basically it's not it's just not going to mess up. So okay, these would be the advantages. And I'll mention something about the advantages. And these are possibly controversial. Maybe they are. Um, uh, the first thing, something like a context optimization control point, it never does anything crazy like characterize a stop sign as a banana or something like that, right? So um, it, it's an extremely strong form of regularization, right? Um, that it's just, you know what it does, right? If you have an LQR controller, it's just not gonna do anything stupid, right? Pe ever, period. Um, the second, which I think is an idea that goes all the way back to the 1960s, uh, early 60s, is the idea is that parameterizing uh, a COCP is better than parameterizing the raw controller or policy, right? Um, and th th that was stated with total clarity in or already in like 1961 and 62, where you know the the basic idea is let's let's just do a linear controller. Uh, let let's let's say you're designing a feedback gain matrix K, and it's like you know eight by twelve or something, right? Um, it's just easier to mess with, let's say, Q and R. Those are the parameters in the LQR controller than it is to come up. With a with a you know with an eight a sensible eight by twelve matrix, um, so um, th th that's been stated in utter clarity, like in 1961, 62, 63. So people people who do that kind of design actually uh, think of think of think of it that way. Now, by the way, uh, this is just I mean I, I there's people I respect who don't believe that and they say nonsense. I can I, I can parameterize my policy uh, you know and just do policy optimization or something. That's fine, but this is just like I said I I I believe this mostly. Okay, next topic is gonna to be uh, tuning. If, yes. If, if I take a convex problem like training an SVM, mm -hmm. why would they never characterize, what was your example, like monkey is a banana, or I forgot what you said. Oh, I don't know, a banana is a stop sign. Yes, yeah. why yeah. would an SVM not do that? Uh, well, first, I'd say, uh, first of all, that's, that's, that's not actually the context. I was, I was talking about a controller, right? That, that solves a convex problem. Uh, but if you want, we, we can think of, of a classifier as a kind of controller, if you like, that's fine. Um, and actually uh, th there, it's gonna depend on your feature engineering, right? So, uh, but if you don't do a lot of feature engineering, I, I can look at your SVM and I can say, look, it's, it's mono whatever it is, it's monotone increasing in this feature. And we can just check, is, does that make sense, not make sense and so on, right? Now, if you, of course, if you engineer crazy features, uh, then you might as well have had a neural network in the beginning, right? So that, that would no, be I guess, my, I guess, my... I guess, I guess the, op the opposite direction is if you don't engineer the features much, maybe the performance will be, will be very robust, but the performance will be fairly low. Absolutely. At the, no, there's, there's always a performance robustness trade-off. That's right. And so what we're looking for are things like, you know, PID. I mean that's a that's a that's a great success that we should uh, celebrate, and that's something that's embarrassingly simple. Uh, delivers okay, even good performance across an enormous number of practical applications. Um, you know, is is it the best you can do? Well, almost certainly not. Uh, but it's it's but but it, in the in the robustness, performance, uh, simplicity, you know, uh, uh, trade off, it, it's looking pretty. It's a pretty attractive, in my opinion, right? And I think these are the same. I'm sort of getting ahead of myself. That's gonna be the final one. Um, let me see a little bit about tuning. Um, so here's the design flow is you would first start by building a high fidelity simulator. You'd use real historical uh, data. Uh, you would probably build a generative model or whatever so that you can generate data that looks like past data, right? So you, you would almost certainly do that. Um, then you would then you you would implement code that does that, that evaluates the true performance objectives. And by the way, that does not have to be the. It certainly doesn't have to be the same as what's going to be in your COCP, right? It it could be very complex, and we even have that in uh, well in in your example just now of uh, of of uh, classification, right? The true performance objective might be. Uh, something like your your uh, your fail your your error error rate, right? Uh, and you're not going to optimize your uh, your convex optimization policy. Might do something like minimize a negative log likelihood of a logistic or something like that. Okay, you'll then choose a parameterized convex optimization based policy, 
and you'll tune the parameters until you're okay with the simulated performance, right? So that's that's that that's sort of the general design flow. Um, and now traditional tuning and tweaking, uh, tweaking is it has a slightly pejorative sound to it. Um, you know, it sounds like someone who doesn't know what they're doing and they just put something together and they tried some parameters and they go, okay, we'll double that one, divide that one by two, and then after they get bored, they quit. Um, but tuning maybe is not is not pejorative. Um, so, um, so the way this would work is you start with some reasonable value for theta and you'd simulate it and then you update theta by hand and then you repeat until you're either happy or you're bored or you're out of time, right? Um, or you could fire up a derivative free method and then go to lunch and come back and it's done, you know, whatever, you know, 5,000 simulations and you have your uh, parameter values, right? So uh, for example, I mean, this is actually how people use things like LQR, Kalman filter, things like that. It's always this way. Um, you know, you look at it, you, you run it into your complicated fancy simulator, you evaluate the true objective and you'd say, you know, it was too, uh, you know, the actuator usage was too high. And you go, no problem. And then you just crank up R or some entry in the R matrix or whatever, and then do another one. So, okay. So this is this is this is the traditional method. It's been done for a long time, and you know, we shouldn't uh, make fun of it because it actually is how a lot of things work. Okay. Um, now you also have auto tuning. Um, auto tuning. Uh, I mean, it's it's also not exactly a new idea. I mean, it goes back to the basically the beginnings of calculus, right? Uh, but it, it's it's become kind of uh, a, a popular, and I'll say a little bit about that in, in, in the last uh, 10, 10 years, right? And so what you do is <laughs> this script L, that's gonna be your true performance objective evaluated via simulation. And you'd update theta, uh, you'd update the parameter values. And for example, by doing a gradient step in the, in, in the parameters, right? Uh, so that's what you do. And you'd project that back, back onto the set here, right? Now, uh, L is often not differentiable. Um, uh, as a matter, yeah, so it's not, it's often not differentiable, but we're going to follow the, the neural network tradition and ignore. So actually that's been a huge advantage. Uh, that's been a huge contribution of, of, you know, people who work on those uh, kinds of things is, is basically to get beyond, is, is to not freeze in terror uh, with your uh, gradient or whatever method. Um, when uh, turns out something's not not differentiable, and I, thought, I, I saw the greatest. I, I love the notation, which is uh, Nabla with quotes around it. And I asked somebody, like, "What does that mean?" And they said, "Oh, simple. The semantics of quote Nabla is this: uh, if L is differentiable at theta k, it's the gradient, right?" Um, other, and I said, yeah, but what if it's not? And then he, and he said, oh, something reasonable might be a, a subgradient, but it actually, there's no reason to think L is convex. So it might, it, so his, the best way they could say is it's something reasonable, right? Um, okay, so this is the idea of auto-tuning. And of course it's, it's used a lot. Um, and, and of course you don't want to tune something on just one simulation. So you want to have a test in the validation simulation, of course. Okay, so let's look at an example of this. Uh, this is, um, this is approximate dynamic programming for box constrained LQR. So here's our, our, here's our, our linear dynamics. We have a, a quadratic cost function, but we, we limit the actuator effort <coughs> to be plus between plus minus one. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna minimize this quadratic here uh, subject to the constraints. So by construction, I'll, I will always satisfy this. Um, now, this thing here is the approximate value function and it is parameterized by this matrix theta. By the way, it's over-parameterized, right? Because I don't know, theta transpose theta is all you need here or something like that. Um, but the point is that, that I don't think that even matters, right? So this, this would be something like your approximate cost. To, this is, this is the, the second term in the ADP formulation. Okay. And you get different controllers when you change theta here. Okay. Um, so, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare uh, clipped LQR, LQR is, is you just form U and then clip it means that if U is outside the range, you just clip uh, the entries. And we'll base that on, we'll also compare that to um, some lower bounds and some fancy um, uh, upper and lower bounds that you get using LMI based methods, okay? So this is tuning. Um, and so here clipped LQR comes in. I mean, this is just an example. So it's not supposed to be fancy or whatever. It's a completely made up example. So here, you know, LQR, if you clip, if you take LQR and clip it, you get an average cost of about 93, right? Um, 
Here, this blue one, that is a lower bound on that original problem. And that, that's constructed by basically solving a convex problem. And it tells you that no policy of any kind can get you as low as whatever, the, whatever that is, 77 or something. I don't know. So, <clears throat> so that's, that's what the blue is. Um, this dashed one is a control that you synthesize you, you know, by solving some you know, fancy semi-definite program and a lot of theory about it and all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, you, know, you have to know a lot of stuff to, to actually pull that off, but it's, an off, it's a pretty good policy. Um, by the way, I have absolutely no idea uh, what the optimal value of this is. Uh, so it's somewhere between 77 and 83. Um, uh, it's actually much more likely to be closer to 83 than it is to 77. Um, still, so the black curve shows this silly policy right here, where theta is simply a matrix. <coughs> what I do is I simulate, I actually, I, what I do is when I change theta, I get a different optimization problem. I do that for each step. I differentiate through the whole thing. It's, it's a non, I'll talk a little bit about how we do that later. Um, and then what you get, it just adjusts theta. And here's what happens if you follow this black curve, you know, then in like five, 10 steps, you have a controller that's as good as the one that you can obtain with all sorts of complicated theory and stuff like that. So it's a little embarrassing, but it's actually, I guess, kind of encouraging, right? That, that, this, is a, this, that this is what this can do. Um, okay. At this point, I want to say a little bit about um, some of the technology behind that, because it's easy enough to say, oh, just differentiate through the, you know, differentiate through the simulator, the simulation with respect to parameters. So let me say a little bit about the technology. Um, so the first, the, fir the, first, uh, the first critical part in the technology are these uh, DSLs or domain specific languages for convex optimization. So <coughs> you, you've seen them, they, they, they just make it easy to specify and solve convex problems, right? And so, uh, and they're kind of cool. They're actually mathematically cool because basically the grammar and the semantics of these DSLs is based on a single rule from convex analysis. So at least in terms of sort of efficiency, uh, it, ha it, it, it satisfies a very nice mathematical aesthetic, right? Where I just say, you wanna use one of these systems, I'm gonna teach you one rule and that's it. You follow this rule and you're good. That's kind of cool. And these also have a kind of a long history that trace back. I believe the first one was uh, YALMIP, which is yet another LMI parser. CVX was uh, written after that in, uh, that's in MATLAB. Um, CVX Pi is uh, a Python uh, version that we use now, convex at jails and Julia. Uh, and there's CVX R, that's, that's an implement, it's an implementation of these things in R. Um, and at the highest level, it's basically this. Um, here's the deal. Uh, you will accept extremely strong restrictions on the problems you can specify. Then basically they have to be not more than convex, they have to be syntactically convex. Um, but in return, uh, your problem is solved globally and efficiently. Actually, there's much more than that. We'll see that you could do things like generate code and things like that. So, so that that is the basic deal. Um, and you know, there's cases where it doesn't make sense. Okay, so here's an example in CVX Pi. Um, <coughs> so, you know, this is Python. I don't want to go into it in too much detail, but for example, here, uh, this is a constructor to make X a parameter. That's going to be something like the current state. Theta is going to be a parameter. That's the matrix, right? Then u is a variable. This is a constructor for a variable. So u is a variable object. And then x next is going to be also a variable. It's the successor to x. And the objective is going to be like some squares of theta times x next plus, you know, uh, quad. This is clearly that's a quadratic form. This is u transpose r u, the second one. And the constraints. This is just a list in Python of two constraints. And the first one is the dynamics, which is that x next is the same as you know, ax, uh, a times x plus b times u, and that the norm of u, the infinity norm, is less than one, right? Then we form a problem, COCP, by, by calling the problem constructor, which takes an objective uh, here, and it takes a list of constraints. And then if you call the solve method, it will actually solve it. So that's an, a, that's an example of, of what this looks like. And I think probably all of you have seen this. Um, and uh, I, honestly, I think that you know, in in real languages like uh, you know uh, Python and and um, and Julia, um, compared to let's say MATLAB where you have CVX, uh, the the CVX thing is is quite is is perfectly charming syntax. It's it's MATLABian or whatever if that's a if if that's a, an, an adjective. 
Um, and it kind of, you know, looks, it's nice. It's, it's the same, you know, it looks like A backslash B. Um, I think this one, this way, which is object oriented, is actually much closer to the way I think of optimization. Literally, they, they are objects. You construct an optimization problem from an objective and a constraint. You construct an objective from a, you know, minimize or maximize or something like that uh, with an expression. I mean, that's, that's how you do it. So this is very close, I think, to the math. Okay, so here's how they work. Um, when you write something like that, the first step is you canonicalize your problem into a standard form. Um, then you solve the standard form uh, problem. Um, then you retrieve the solution of your problem from the standard form solution. So these are the three steps, the canonicalize, solve, retrieve. Um, now, the truth is that 99.9% .9 of the users of these things don't, don't know this, and that's totally cool. Why, why should they know? I, I don't want them, I don't, they don't need to know. Um, and all they do is they form their problem, they call the solve method and you get a solution, right? So we, we think of this as like a three-step mapping from the problem parameters to the solution. It's actually quite interesting. So you start with the problem parameters. That'd be the theta in, the, uh, in, in, in your COCP, let's say. That's canonicalized into, that's your solver. There's a set of parameters here. Those are the parameters that you pass to the, that's how you instantiate the problem that you want the solver to solve. Right? Suppose you compile to a QP, you pass the QP parameters here. The solver solves it and then gives you something like an X, an op, uh, a solution. This is sort of like the X coming out of, the, or you know, whatever, X solver. Um, and then that gets retrieved and mapped back into the solution that you want. So that's, that's kind of the idea. So by the way, if we're going to differentiate through this stack, we're going to differentiate the solution with respect to the parameters. This tells us a very good way uh, to do this, right? It's going to be by the chain rule and blah, blah, blah. Um, and some will be, we'll see the two of these are straightforward and one is tricky. Okay, now if you accept some additional restrictions on how the parameters enter into the problem, then the canonicalization and retrieval maps can be arranged to be linear, which is amazing. So it says basically this is linear and that's linear. So that says that when your parameters come in, you go through a linear mapping to form the QP before you call a QP solver or SOCP, whatever it is. And not only that, when, once that thing finishes its solve, you go through another uh, linear mapping to get the solution. Now, <laughs> that's kind of cool because, well, I know the derivative of a, of, of a, of a linear mapping is itself. Um, uh, this also gives you a whole lot of other, uh, uh, it's gonna give you a bunch of other stuff for free. I'll talk about some of that in a minute. Um, so that's the idea. Um, now, obviously the derivative of the linear parts is just themselves, right? So all you have to do is differentiate through the solution of a convex optimization problem. Um, I'm not gonna talk about that. It's an interesting topic. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting because, okay, we can start with this. The mapping from parameters to solution to, for an optimization problem, even a convex one, doesn't even have to be single valued. I mean, you can obviously have multiple solutions. So, so even if it's single valued, it doesn't have to be continuous, like at all. Like does that have to be continuous? Even if it's continuous, it does not have to be differentiable, and it often is not differentiable. So, forgetting all of that, uh, this is still uh, this is still what you do. So you you can chain and you can chain these things and automatically and efficiently compute this. That's where you're differentiating through the dynamics, all sorts of other stuff. Um, we we do we can do that in either uh, you know PyTorch or in TensorFlow. The, these kind of systems that we're we're just. Uh, on the coattails of people who've developed uh, those those fantastic systems. Okay, so uh, this is this is implemented. And our implementation is called CVX Pi Layers, um, <clears throat> and what it allows you to do. I mean, this is just like pseudo code for. It's actually not that far from actual code. It's very close, basically. Um, this is actually literally a simulate. That's a simulator that runs uh, a convex optimization control policy, hundred steps. Um, and then in the end, when if you just if you call this theta torch dot grad, that actually will give you the gradient of the cost with respect to the hyper the parameters, okay, the the the, the thetas, right? So which is amazing, yeah. I mean, which is very simple and pretty cool. Um, by the way, one bonus there that I'll talk about is a code generation. So. Um, this form, which is CSR, where C and R are literally just sparse matrices, um, what that does is that allows the canonicalization and the retrieval are super fast. And then what this means is you actually have this is this is the basis for code generation, which I, we we have a 
I don't know, pretty good beta version working right now. And we've done code generation in the past for other things, um, but this is under CDX Pi. Um, we, we have code generation kind of working there. I'll, I'll maybe say a little bit about that later, but it's actually very cool that that's that the same thing that allows you to differentiate through a convex optimization control policy also allows you to evaluate it super fast and with total reliability, right? So, I mean, you have to make sure your solver is totally reliable, but other than that, it's super fast. Okay. So I'm going to finish up with some conclusions, which is going to leave us a bunch of time for discussion, I think. Um, so I'll start with the, the simple ones, right? So my claim is uh, COCPs, they're, they're, they're simple and interpretable. Uh, we know how they work, right? You know, they don't do anything crazy, right? If you solve, uh, you know, whatever, if you do MPC, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to do anything stupid. It just cannot. Um, it's going to handle change, constraints, um, changes, failures gracefully. Um, you can safety fence it. That's actually really uh, quite important, right? That you can actually add all these constraints. These are things that shouldn't happen. And you just put some in the code, you put something that says, um, if this constraint is ever tight, you know, somebody's got to, something's really wrong and somebody's got to take a look at it. Um, and the point is they can be effectively tuned quasi-automatically. That's, that's by, you know, CVX by layers or by similar methods, right? Um, so there's actually everything you need to do all of this is there. Um, uh, some of it is, is not quite there. Uh, the code generation doesn't quite work, but the rest of it kind of does. Um, and so it, it, we can actually implement these. <coughs> and I'll end up with, I think it's a, a maybe controversial. Maybe it's not, I don't know. Anyway, here it is. I would claim uh, tune COCP, that's the PID controller of the 21st century. And what that means is, I don't mean anything fancy by this. There's no claims of performance and all that kind of stuff. Uh, what it says is if, if you have a controller problem, uh, which is amenable to something like this, this just says the same way 100 years ago you would first try PID, I would first try tune COCP, uh, that it would be an awfully good uh, method to, 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 to start with. So that's actually all I'm saying. And I, I, I don't think that is controversial. Um, uh, so, uh, but when I say this, and I mean, other people have asked things like, oh, isn't this just RL or whatever? And I said, well, it is RL, but with a, it's with a very specific form. It's with a strong inductive bias that actually what you should be doing is solving a convex optimization policy to come up with your, to come up with your actual uh, policy. Okay, so I think at that point, I, I will, uh, I'll, I'll stop and I'll, I'll be very, very happy to answer uh, questions now. Thanks, Stephen, for the nice talk. Yeah, I think in this era of deep RL, I think it reminds us how nice it still is to do commercialization. Um, and then um, there's one um, question in the chat. I'll just read it. Um, okay. It's from Meng Yang. So thanks for a great mm -hmm. talk. For nonlinear dynamics, it seems the idea is related to, is related to uh, ensemble common filter and data assimilation, assuming mm -hmm. UD may be considered as parameters or initial conditions. Could you have some comments on changing the problem to a common optimization when states have a large dimension? Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, so first of all, um, you can apply. There, there are context optimization control policies for problems where the dynamics are not linear. Um, so the, the minimum requirements that I know of are uh, convexity in U, uh, period, with, with, with no requirements on how X comes in, how the state might come in. So that, that would be sort of a, that, that would be kind of a, a, a minimum there. And that, that, so I, I mean, I can certainly write down a COCP that will control a car or a rocket or an airplane or a missile easily, 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 right? And that's, so, so it, it's not, I, what I can't do is I can't do MPC when the when the dynamics are nonlinear, but I can I can do that. Then there was the question about what high dimensional. I, 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 yeah, so when sorry, states have a very large dimension. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Okay, fine. It was taking me a while to get the <laughs> to get the chat window open. Um, oh, uh, I think the question see. is like yeah, changing the problem to a conversation when states have a large dimension. That's the, that's the one question actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think you already like touched the. Yeah, maybe I did already touch on that. I, I don't know how dimension has anything to do with convexity, though. To be honest, uh, that that I, I I'm not sure. They, those those seem to be different things to me. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. um, so we I, now I can see. It. I, have, I have a second uh, question is about well PID tuned by let's say Ziegler Nichols tuning rules. 
does not need the model of the system. CFCP uh, still needs the model of the system. Um, actually, it's very interesting to, to say what tuned COCP needs. Um, if you have the real system, you can do it just like Ziegler Nichols. There's like, that is not a problem. If you have the thing in front of you and you have a, you, yeah, and, you, and you put your embed, you use embedded code and you download it and now you can mess with theta and run it, uh, you can do it exactly like Zeke or Nichols with absolutely no change whatsoever, okay? I mean, you're not gonna do it exact. I mean, the tuning is gonna be different, but you're gonna, you're gonna run experiments. You're gonna change the theta, uh, download it to your real-time controller, run it, take some measurements or whatever, think a little bit, update the thetas and do it again. So that would be the same. Um, what you what, what's actually interesting now, of course, I mean, this is kind of obvious, totally obvious, but we have um, is what, what is what you really would like to do is to be able to speed that up and not do it with the hardware in the loop as traditional PID tuning would be, um, is actually to have a nice simulation model, right? And so you, you are going to need a, a, a simulation model. Um, I, I think with kind of a lot of modern engineering, to be honest, it's very weird if you don't have a simulation model, right? So if, if I walk in somewhere and they say, what are you doing on doing X? And I'm good. Do you have a simulator? And if they say no, I, I'm deeply suspicious, right? Because it, the simulator, I mean, and it's perfectly okay for them to say, I have a simulator. I don't really trust it, but it kind of tells me if, it's, if what I'm doing is stupid or not. And that's fine. Uh, that, that's totally okay. But so I, I, I think if you don't have a simulator, I'm not sure you should be designing a controller uh, unless you're doing like, you know, Ziegler nickel style stuff, right? Uh, so so that, would, that would be my point. Um, yeah. Um, so, and uh, you can do, uh, ADP does not require you to have a model of the system, right? What you, do, what you are gonna need is to carry out the simulations uh, to figure out what's a good approximate value function, you're gonna need a simulator and that's gonna, that's gonna require a model. So yeah, that's, that's at least my, my thoughts on that. Cool. I guess I have a, I have a question. So uh, it's maybe yeah. related to uh, your discussion with Renee uh, about, about this, like uh, the errors uh, possibly also in the like conventionalization that kind of context. So for example, if you, have an SVM where you have like commercialization, but if you have like overfitting or you have like distribution shifts, you're still going to like make those like mistakes. But then I, I guess that my I guess my, my guess uh, the point is like uh, in the commercialization context, like it's easier to get guarantees and then uh, it also depends on the kind of application like you are like uh, you're working on like in terms of like this tra trade-off between like robustness and the performance. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe certain certain critical applications are like more yeah, sure. Yeah, more yeah. simple. Yeah. And, I, yeah. You know, well, one of the things you mentioned was about guarantees. Um, mm. I, I think uh, we as an entire field that is control, I think, I think we need to back off on that, right? Because of course it's nice to be able to say, oh, I have a guarantee and I can solve this problem and blah, blah, blah. Or, oh, I'm no more than, you know, two over square root pi suboptimal or whatever. But when you make a statement like that, you're making a whole lot of assumptions. First of all, that your model is right, that a lot of other stuff is right, that this is really the objective, and it probably isn't really the objective. So, I, I mean, I think I think those results are great, but I, th I think we just have to be much more modest with them uh, than I think some people are. Um, and it is absolutely false that that people will not implement things if they don't have a quote guarantee. Um, mm -hmm. Now, the flip side, though, I think is super important. That the basic idea is is, you know, do you, do you trust this or something like that, right? Um, and I think, you know, that that's something where I can and have made that argument to people who said like, like wait, do you have any idea what will happen if this thing messes up? Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes. Uh, and then, so that that we can actually say, I mean, um, so that, that, that was interesting. I, I, I can give you an example of, uh, so I was talking to someone who was gonna do some real MPC type stuff. Um, and, uh, so I went in, you know, with kind of a naive academics idea that they would ask things like, oh, I noticed that you only do the maximum number of iterations is 20 steps. Actually, not the maximum. It turns out we always did 20 steps, period. Whether you converged or not, even if you converge in seven, you keep doing the remaining 13 steps, right? So you always do 20 steps. I thought we would, that's an interior point method. So that solves it like 99.999% of the time, right? So, so the, I thought the questions would be things like, you know, 
how, how do you know this actually gets solved in 20 iterations, right? Um, those weren't the questions at all. Not zero. They had no interest whatsoever. I said, no, it always does. And they go, cool, that's fine, great. <laughs> so, and we showed them, right? Then, then the, the, the real question was this. Um, how, do you, how do I know that in the middle of that thing, there can't be a floating point divided by zero error? Mm. That's what I really want to know, right? Yeah, a lot of flops goes down when you solve, a, let's say, a, a, a QP to, to come up with a thing. And, and so that, that's actually interesting. And actually, the cool part is you can actually do that. You can actually, you can actually arrange some of these things to be division-free, division or in one case, you know, for an interpoint method, is super interesting. It would be, you would, uh, it wouldn't be division-free, but you would know the following. Every time you divide, you know the sign at the denominator. And if you are in that situation, I'm talking about every single floating point division in the entire thing. When you're in that situation, it's awesome because I can make that safe. I, I, I basically repl replace div with S div. S div goes like this. If you're doing A over B, if B is supposed to be positive, you have to know whether the sign of each thing. If I know B is positive, I replace B with the, with the maximum of epsilon and B and proceed. Um, and now I can get absolutely guarantee you that when you execute this, there cannot be a floating point divided by zero error. Okay, so that's a, that's an example of that. But anyway, so the, yeah, there so there are uh, so mm -hmm. it's, you know it, it it's weird. I just we shouldn't get too serious about you know uh, claiming guarantees and things like sure. that because no one. I mean, for a lot of these things, you, you no one has real models for them anyway. So yeah, good question. Yeah. Perfect. I have one question. Um, first of all, thank you for the great talk. So I have a question uh, in the part about differentiating through convex programs. Mm -hmm. So for example, let's consider a scenario where the, the parameter is not a tuning parameter that we control. Basically, it's a parameter that changes over time, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. um, so my question is that uh, is, I'm asking for your opinion that whether differentiating through the convex program and use this sensitivity information from this gradient to basically update the solution for the mm -hmm. next problem as a warm start. Or mm, whether no, that, so that's interesting, but it's a good question uh, because it, I should have been much clearer about what I meant by parameters. These are parameters that are 100% under our control. We use them to flavorize the policy. These are not the parameters that are outside our control, which indeed could be time varying and things like that. That's a, that's a totally different thing. And I can calculate the gradient with respect to that. I mean, if I wanted to find out, like, if I wanted to say something like how much worse could it have been for me, that would tell me that. Um, but so the parameters I'm talking about here are the ones that are 100% under our control and they are typically constant, right? You can make much fancier things and people have, like here's an example. You could say, I'm actually gonna change the parameters based on something that I'm going to uh, gain schedule on, for example, in the, in the control uh, dialect, you would say that. So, you know, depending on dynamic pressure, I'm going to change things. Then indeed that would change across time too. Um, but, and, and there we would, we would actually have a parameter for each of different ranges of dynamic pressure or something like that. And, and that would be fine. Uh, so maybe I, I, I misunderstood, but I, I just wanted to clarify what I meant by parameters. Yeah, so, so I guess my question is that let's consider we want to exploit this differentiating for problems that theta is not under control, basically they change over time. And we want to use this uh, derivative of the solution with respect to the parameter to update our solution for the next problem that we want to solve. Let's consider mm. an NPC, right? So uh, our states, so the MPC policy is a piecewise mm -hmm. affine function of our current states under some assumptions. So when the state changes, when you want to solve another round of the MPC problem, That's right. differentiate through it, update mm -hmm. the policy a little bit, and then resolve again. I wonder if this is this has been done, whether you- It's, it's been done. So I, I think the bigger question related to your question is this, it's in COCP, warm start or not? Exactly. That's that's the, the big parent question of, of your question, right? And you know, so the arguments in in the pro arguments would go like this: You're like, dude, you just solved a problem that was extremely similar 15 milliseconds ago. You'd be an idiot not to start from that solution, right? And and so that that's a that's pretty good if that can drop you from whatever 100 iterations down to three, like awesome, and that makes it work. That's fun. The argument against, which is actually maybe more compelling, but I'll say it, is that. When you do that, when you do warm start, 
um, your convex optimization control policy um, is not stateless. It actually now has an invisible estate, which is basically the last thing you solved. Now, maybe through extensive simulation, you can verify that that is a non-problem. That's fine. Uh, but the point is, it's now a the whole thing is a little more complicated than you thought. So actually, it's actually in, in some ways, it's almost better and cleaner to do uh, not a warm start, but a cold start. And that, that actually makes your COCP policy absolutely stateless. And that's great because it means does, you know, you don't have to worry about the interaction. It, it's contributing zero dynamics itself. I guess that's the right way to say it. Um, but you're right, uh, people do both. And I, I could imagine good applications where one or the other, warm start or not, would be a good idea. Thank you. Okay, can, can you clarify, I have first clarifying this state dependence, like uh, if the optimal solution of what you're getting is unique, then will that not get rid of this dependence from your previous solution? Uh, See, sorry, I, I, I didn't get the gist of that. Is, is this a continuation of what we were just talking about? The state? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, yes, that's right. That's, that's exactly right. That if the solver has a, has a state, like for example, it caches the last thing it solved, right? Um, then it, it's got a state. Uh, stateless means it simply, uh, it, it simply gets the new data and solves that problem as if it has never seen it before, right? So that's a difference. And that has, a, 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 that has an information pattern advantage, which is it's stateless. It's a, it's a function that should always return the same thing, always. It, it, not, it should have nothing to do with how it got there. It should just give it, uh, it should just compute that state. But maybe I'm not understanding your question. Yeah. Um. No, my, my question, maybe I'm not fully understanding the context of what you're thinking about. It's like, my, my thought was like, okay, you're trying to solve a complex optimization problem and basically you're gonna get a solution and that solution is in many cases unique. So when, wh from where you start, doesn't really matter. It's just, you might get faster to the solution. That's right. Yeah, so that's the, if you allow if 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 you allow it to uh, to run to completion. There's a very big difference between something you'd use in a real time uh, a solver for a real time embedded system is 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 very different from a solver you would use like you would use if you fire up CVXPy and use you know whatever Ecos or you know Mosaic or something. Um, so the way those work is this: uh, they keep going until their stopping criteria are satisfied, and so you have variable runtime. Okay. Now, if you're just doing a simulation or, you know, that's exactly the right way to do it, right? So, so you know, you're solving a QP and this one took five milliseconds, that took five, five, and then you throw a, a hard, a quote hard one at it and it takes uh, 137 milliseconds, right? No, it's fine for a lot, of, for people like, I mean, if you're doing simulation or non-real-time tasks, that's perfect. But for a real-time one, you have a hard deadline, you have 25 milliseconds and period, you better have like, I mean, whatever happens, whatever you give you, whatever you return in 25 milliseconds has got to be pretty, if not a solution, it's got to be pretty good. Um, and so the real-time ones typically, actually they very often do something even crazier, which is that they do a fixed number of iterations. Um, so that that's not uncommon, <laughs> right? Um, so, uh, which is actually, if you think about it, quite clever, because you don't even want, you don't even need the logic for stopping criteria. Right. The the logic is you do twenty steps, um, so that so, that's a so they're quite different. So I, I do have like a like a I know we're running out of time, but I want to make one more question mm -hmm. and get your sure. thoughts. So it's like it's actually about your quote there. So uh, I agree with you. PID controllers are great and have been like a, a tr tremendous success, right? Uh, but there's the task that you're trying to solve is arguably simple, right? Regulation, mm -hmm. tracking, whatever you want to think about, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Now I see COCP is going to be arguably more flexible, but don't you think there's also like a, a limitation on the complexity of the task that you oh, could solve? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that, that's, that's exactly right, right? So, so I think, you know, for example, for PID, someone says, well, what can it apply to? The answer is like, what's the model of the dynamics in PID? It's basically this, it, it's extremely vague. It just says basically, it's like here, it's this. If you turn this knob up and wait a while, eventually the output will go up. That, that is actually the dynamic model that is associated with PID, right? And 
So, and the same is true here. I mean, there, there will be tons of problems which are just way too tricky and complicated and you couldn't possibly do anything with COCP. Um, my feeling on that is don't. However, I do think there's a whole lot of problems you can solve with COCP, like a whole lot, way more than people are, are letting on uh, or know or something like that. Maybe they just don't know. That's the charitable, uh, that's my charitable reasoning. Um, or they're just not letting on, which is worse, right? Uh, so I think there's a whole lot. I mean, things like you can do supply chain stuff, you can do all sorts of crazy stuff with it. And, and it, I, I think it, it covers a lot of things. Um, and obviously not everything. I mean, there's tons of things, way too complicated, hideous, nonlinear dynamics. This, is, this part is unknown, that's unknown. By all means, use something fancier for that, by all means, uh, or less fancy, but just more simulation based. So that's my thought on it. Well, are there any questions? Any more questions? Cool. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, it's a yeah, great thanks. discussion. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. Those fantastic questions. Good. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. I think this concludes our today's winter school. Uh, we have another set of great talks tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. So uh, I look forward to seeing everyone there. Uh, thank you very much for uh, yeah, the participation. Thank you, everyone. See you tomorrow.